today I'm going to tell you about our project, which is currently in phase two, which is to use genetic engineering uh, to develop new tools to combat aquatic invasive species. And let's see if the slide will advance. There we go. Okay, so you, you know there's a, a slew of techniques to control invasive species from physical methods like netting and removal, chemical methods like using uh, toxins or pheromones, uh, and biological methods. Uh, this is a, the talk today is going to focus on something called genetic biocontrol, which in a nutshell is using, uh, you know, not necessarily genetic engineering, although that's going to be the focus of this talk, but using some approach to convert the pest organism into the pesticide so that you can release modified organisms into the environment and they are going to work for us to decrease the population numbers of the target pest. Um, there's a lot of advantages of genetic biocontrol over traditional control methods. Uh, they all rely on the natural mating behavior of the biocontrol agent that you release back into the wild. And because of that, they tend to be much more species specific. Uh, a genetic biocontrol agent aimed to target common carp isn't gonna try to mate with walleye or smallmouth bass, so it's not gonna decrease the numbers of those fish. And so there's more specificity with genetic biocontrol than there is with things like chemical control. Uh, it's shown to be effective, it's shown to be scalable. Um, there's a, a number of different methods that one can achieve genetic biocontrol. Uh, and I'll introduce you to a few of them in the next couple of slides here. One is called sterile male release. Now, I think this is what I consider to be the most effective pest control that's ever been developed. Um, from the 1960s until the early 2000s, there was a massive campaign to eradicate a pest from the entire continent of North America the New World screw worm was, a, was the pest. And they achieved sterile male release in this case by using not genetic engineering, but gamma radiation. So they would irradiate, they would mass rear this pest organism, the New World screw worm. They would irradiate it in these chambers that you can see in the upper right to the point that it wasn't dead, but it was sterile. They could release those sterile males and females out into the environment. Uh, if a sterile male mated with a wild female, that female wouldn't have offspring. And so they would uh, release millions and millions of these each week, pushing the edge of where that invasive species had uh, invaded in North America, eventually to uh, eradicate it from all of Southern United States, Mexico and Central America. And they still release tens of millions of uh, gamma irradiated New World screw worms every year in Panama to maintain a, a firewall, if you will, and prevent it from moving back up the isthmus. Uh, so sterile male release is one technique. Uh, some of the downsides to the traditional way that sterile male release is applied is that a lot of organisms uh, don't have a sterilizing dose of radiation that's uh, sufficiently below the lethal dose of radiation. And so it's, it can be a tough needle eye to thread. Uh, if you give them too much radiation, you're going to make the males so sickly that they're not going to be able to compete with wild males to mate with the wild females. And if you don't give enough radiation, then you're not sterilizing them and you're just releasing more of the pest organism. Uh, so there's approaches, and one of which I'm going to tell you about in this talk, to hardwire the sterility using genetic engineering, and that's the, the basis of the project. But sterile male release isn't the only form of genetic biocontrol. Uh, you may have heard in the field of aquatic invasive species of sex ratio biasing. So Ron Thresher in the bottom right of the slide pioneered a, a, a technique called daughterless carp. Um, did a lot of modeling, did a lot of public engagement, never actually got this to work in carp, in part because I think it was just a little bit too early. Uh, the tools for rational genome engineering in the early 2000s, when Ron was mostly working on this, uh, weren't what they are today. But for sex ratio biasing, the goal is to uh, skew the ratio of males to females in a way that it can't support population numbers anymore. So the, the hereditary tree in the top left 
uh, shows what would happen in a non-engineered population. You have males mate with females. Roughly 50% of the offspring are males and females. This male with a green circle around it in the bottom left is meant to denote a biocontrol agent that's been engineered in this case to uh, inactivate the gene that's normally responsible for converting male sex hormones into female sex hormones. So that genetically engineered fish will have offspring that can't produce female sex hormones and they're all gonna develop into males. Uh, so you can see down here, half of those male offspring will inherit that same gene. And so all of their offspring will be males uh, and et cetera. Over time, that's gonna create a population that doesn't have enough females to support population numbers and the population will crash. Uh, there's ways to do the, there's ways to achieve this with genetic engineering. There's also ways to achieve this using chromosome manipulation. Uh, that's already been developed and in, in field trial at different parts of the country uh, targeting brook trout. You may have heard about a, a new class of technology called gene drives. It's been in the popular press a bunch in the past uh, five years or so. This is enabled by a, a class of tools called CRISPR-Cas, which are really good molecular scissors for cutting parts of the DNA. And gene drive allows for something that we call super Mendelian inheritance. Uh, Mendelian inheritance is named after Gregor Mendel. He's a scientist from a uh, hundred years ago that was doing crosses with pea pods. You probably learned about him in high school biology class. Uh, and normal Mendelian inheritance says that if you have an organism uh, that received a paternal copy of a gene and a maternal pop copy of a gene, it's going to pass each of those two copies on 50% to all of its offspring. So if there's a transgene, a transgenic organism that mates with a wild organism, the transgenic progeny from that organism have just one copy of the transgene. And so 50% of their offspring are going to in inherit that copy and 50% of their great grandkids are going to inherit that copy. Um, and so the, the, uh, the frequency of that transgene in the population isn't going to change over time. However, with a gene drive, there's ways to engineer what we call a selfish genetic element. And so the engineered organism, if it mates with a wild type, all of its offspring have the engineered gene. And when those mate with wild type, all of their offspring have the engineered gene. And over time, you can drive an engineered gene through a population like wildfire. And this can be designed in a way to replace a population or to uh, eradicate a population. I'll say these are still uh, in development. No gene drives have been released in the field. None are even ready for a field trial at this point, but they have been demonstrated in labs to work. And so there's this large spectrum. Uh, I, sh I shared three specific examples, but there's about uh, between 10 and 12 different genetic biocontrol methods using genetic engineering uh, that all have different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, one of the dimensions that we compare them on is how persistent will the transgene or the biocontrol agent be once it's released into the wild. Something like a sterile insect, so that those sterile male releases, that would be sterile insect technique or SIT. If you release a sterile male, it can't pass its genes on, right? Even if it mates with a wild female, uh, they're not going to have any offspring. So those genes are not going to persist you need to release sterile males over and over and over again every few weeks for it to achieve population control. But it's seen as a relatively conservative or safe control method because if you ever want to take your foot off the gas, you just stop releasing the sterile males and there's no more transgenes after that last generation dies out. Uh, things like gene drives, which are over here in the red uh, part of the graph, those, if you release even in theory a couple of gene drive organisms, those uh, transgenes or non-natural genes can keep spreading through the environment for many generations. And so you know, understanding the strengths and weaknesses of each of these techniques and uh, trying them out in safe contained lab environments is kind of where the field is at right now. And you'll see that's uh, what we're doing in this CARP project. Uh, I want to stress though that genetic biocontrol is not science fiction. It's not a thing of the future. It's uh, uh, technology that's available in present time. So in insects where genetic biocontrol has been advanced the furthest, there have been field trials and it's even being sold commercially in some countries, uh, genetically engineered mosquitoes that will suppress local populations. 
Uh, genetic biocontrol has been developed for fish. Uh, the sex ratio biasing approaches that rely on sex chromosome manipulation are being field trialed in Idaho and New Mexico. Um, there are genetically sterile fish that have been that are in use, uh, ironically more for invasive plant control. Um, but again, these are sterile fish that can't propagate once released to the environment. And gene drive is, is a newer technology. It's lagging behind the others. Uh, so how do these really work? I think it's important to know how they work at a molecular level. Uh, I'm going to go into detail on one specific technique called engineered genetic incompatibility. This is our approach for genetically hardwiring uh, that sterile male approach. Uh, we don't need to use radiation to sterilize the males. Uh, we can use genetic engineering. And the idea would be that uh, if once we engineer are genetically incompatible males. One thing that's better about our technique compared to just using radiation to sterilize males is if you generate a sterile biocontrol agent and you wanna produce millions more, uh, if it's sterile, it can't produce more by definition. So our fish aren't actually sterile or won't be actually sterile, but they'll be incompatible with any wild fish. And that means that in a controlled lab environment, we can breed our engineered fish to each other and, and make offspring using conventional uh, aquaculture techniques. Any fish that we release to the environment though, won't be able to have offspring if they mate with wild fish. And so the idea would be you'd use phys physical methods to you know, net or trap fish and reduce the numbers in a body of water, release only male of the biocontrol agents and any female that they mate with or any egg that they fertilize won't develop into a, a viable adult. And so through this way, we could eventually uh, squelch out those last remaining wild fish from a body of water. Now, this is going to be the uh, most risky part of the talk. I, I just a few days ago learned that there is a YouTube video made in 2018 describing our technology. And I think it's great and it does a very good job of describing how it works. So I'm going to try to play this in the slide. And Corey's going to jump on and tell me if the volume doesn't come through. You may need to play with your volume on your side to make sure you can hear it, but uh, here it goes. We're not getting the audio. You're not getting the audio. Okay, but let me try. If you, um, if you unshare and then reshare your presentation in that window where you select what window to share, you can check share computer sound, that should make it work. Okay, uh, let me do that then. Just the checkbox at the bottom of that window. Yes, you are right. But I can't check the box apparently. No. Oh. Um, so maybe I don't have that permission. Um, guess, let me look. I stopped it anyways to, uh, if we get this to work and, and we might not get it to work, I can explain the technology in my own words, uh, just the cartoons and animated graphics that uh, these videographers produced are quite helpful. Um, and they make some pop culture references that I wasn't aware about to movies that, uh, science fiction movies that develop similar technologies. I'm going to try it again. I just adjusted your settings. So I should stop, share, and reshare again. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Still not going up. I wonder if I do this one. No. Oh, maybe advanced. Still no. Okay. All right. So we're going to. Uh, What I can do, if you have a pen and paper, you can write down exploding yeast to protect the wild. Um, maybe in the Q&A, if, if I have time, I'll put the link, or maybe Corey, you, if you find the link, you can okay. drop it into the chat. Uh, it's a neat video. Yet. And uh, don't watch it during the presentation, but you can watch it right afterwards. Okay. Um, so let's, all right, moving on. Um, all right, so after all that, I'm still sharing my screen, Corey. Yes, looks great. 
Perfect. <clears throat> okay, so the, basically the way that our engineering works is we engineer, and you're gonna see some different organisms. We're developing this in insects and fish and plants all at the same time. Uh, we're further ahead in insects than we are in fish. So a lot of the examples I'm gonna show you of how it works are examples from fruit flies, uh, but it's gonna work exactly the same in carp. And at the end, I'll give you an update on how far along we are in carp. Uh, so our engineered genetically incompatible line, which are here in yellow, and they won't, well, actually they, they could be yellow. I'll say that normally we don't have to make them differently colored, uh, but that could be a feature that we add in just for easier identification of the transgenic organisms. But they uh, are engineered to, so that they're homozygous or have two copies of two important elements. Uh, one is a gene that will find, it's a gene that will turn on another gene in the genome to a level that's uh, so high that it's gonna kill the developing organism. And so we're not introducing any toxins per se, but it turns out that we all have genes that need to be turned on to certain levels. Turning genes on, it's kind of more like a dimmer switch than a, a binary light switch. Genes can be turned on to low, medium, or strong levels. And a lot of genes need to be turned on just to a, you know, a three or a four. And if you turn those genes all the way up to 11, it's bad for the cell, bad for the organism. Alternatively, you could imagine uh, turning on a gene in the brain that's only supposed to be turned on in, in the heart tissue. That's gonna be bad for the developing brain. Uh, so our engineered organisms have these, these molecular tools called programmable gene activators. And the programmable gene activators are targeting a gene that's sensitive to being turned on to too high of a level. Uh, but the engineered organism, normally if you have that tool turned on and, and turning on the gene uh, in a cell, it's going to kill the organism but our engineered organisms are resistant. It's like they have the toxin and the antidote together. Uh, when they mate with wild type, they pass the toxin on, but not the antidote. And so the hybrids between wild type and the engineered organism are all inviolable. Uh, but if we cross two engineered organisms to each other, they pass on the toxin and the antidote and all the offspring survive. That's how we can propagate them to generate a uh, larger, release numbers. So we demonstrated this in flies. I'll show you what we do to characterize it is we do these matings in flies where uh, we mate the males and females of the engineered organism together. We mate male and female wild type together. And then we do a male wild type to a female EGI, a male EGI to a female wild type. And in insects, we count the number of eggs, larvae, and pupa that develop from those. So in this slide, I am going to show you a video that will work. There's no sound in this video. So if you're not hearing anything, that's fine. I'm just going to talk over it. Uh, the pictures at the bottom show you what the, uh, the female and male adult genotypes are. So brown signifies a wild genotype and yellow signifies a, a engineered genotype. And now what you saw, this is a time-lapse video over 15 days. So there were a bunch of adults in there for the first three days and they all disappeared. If they didn't die, we just removed them from the vials. Uh, we let them in there for three days to give those adults a chance to mate. The females would lay their eggs in this uh, medium in the bottom. And really what we care about is what happens to those eggs. So after uh, the male and female adults mated, what you can see already is in the tubes in the side, which are what we call the conspecific mating. So like to like, uh, we see larvae emerge from the eggs. The larvae are crawling around in the tubes. When they attach to the side of the tubes and turn dark, that's pupation. So uh, you can think of a caterpillar in a little chrysalis, although this is a fruit fly version, not as cute. Um, if you look carefully at the tubes in the middle, you do see some movement. Um, we did get eggs laid, and we did get larvae emerging from those. And that's proof to us that mating occurred. So it's not that our engineered flies just fail to mate with the wild flies. They do mate with the wild flies. Larvae emerge. It turns out, depending on what gene we target in the system, we can control if the hybrid offspring die at the egg stage, at the embryo stage, at the pupil stage, or sometimes even at, as early adults. And so this is kind of the end of the 15-day time course. You see that we get viable, happy, uh, normal adults in the two side tubes but no adults emerged from the tubes in the middle. 
And so we can quantify this as shown in the graph at the left. Here we're showing the number of surviving progeny when we mate different genotypes together. Uh, and this is an example of what we call extreme underdominance. So there's zero survivability of any of the hybrids. And it's bi-directional. It doesn't matter if we mate uh, female engineered to male wild type or male engineered to female wild type. Further, we can actually engineer an arbitrarily large number of different what we call synthetic species uh, for a given target organism. And each of those synthetic species are incompatible with wild type and they're all incompatible with each other. And we have a paper coming out in the next few months that'll show that this has really important ramifications for being able to avoid genetic resistance. Uh, but I won't go into the details of that. And one last example I'll give you from flies, which is the, the latest iteration of this technology, is that we've taken the, the genotype that encodes for that genetic incompatibility, and we've added to those biocontrol agents another genetic element that will give conditional female lethality. That means that when we're rearing organisms in the lab, we include a special small molecule called tetracycline, when tetracycline is present, males and females survive. So we can propagate the line in the lab, make more biocontrol agents as long as tetracycline is around. However, when we uh, grow them without tetracycline, the females will all die and only males will survive. So this is a way that we can ensure that if we're releasing only males to a body of water, for example, uh, that, that we're not gonna have any females persisting. Females won't survive in nature uh, where that small molecule is not around. So we've demonstrated this in flies, we've demonstrated with controlled uh, lab cage trials that this works for population eradication of wild type fruit flies. Again, I won't go into the data, uh, but I'll, I bring that up to highlight that we know this system works in a higher eukaryote. Uh, and now I'm gonna transition to talking about what have we done for aquatic invasive species. Uh, I mentioned, I think that this is our second phase of MACERT funding. Uh, moving in aquatic invasive species, the progress of research is much slower because the target organisms that we care about take longer to work with. They take longer for a generation to reach sexual maturity. Uh, it takes longer to develop transgenesis protocols. Our goals for the first phase of the project were to identify which genes can we turn up to, to kill the developing embryos. Uh, to develop spawning, uh, laboratory spawning protocols and transgenesis methods in the MACERC containment lab. And I can show you where we do that for those of you that take the tour tomorrow. And to perform some public outreach to just gauge uh, the public perceptions around genetic biocontrol in relation to physical or chemical methods. <clears throat> Here is the evidence that we have genes that we can uh, turn up to kill developing embryos. This is actually evidence from zebrafish, but we know these genes uh, are present in carp and should work to uh, kill hybrid carp if genes like GATA5, which are, these are all developmental genes that control normal development of, of fish. And for example, uh, we can inject genetic reagents uh, into fish and they develop normally. Uh, but if we target genes like SHHA or GATA5, which are two developmental genes, uh, the fish don't develop normally. GATA5 is dead already at 24 hours. SHHA is very abnormal. It's going to die in the next 24 hours. And so we have genes that will uh, kill hybrid, uh, hybrids between our engineered fish and wild fish at really early time points. <clears throat> we had to kind of reinvent the wheel and learn how to make transgenic carp in uh, the first phase of the project. So what you're seeing here, even though the illustration on the right shows uh, pictures that look more like zebrafish and that, that is what they're supposed to look like, the fish in the bottom uh, center of the slide are engineered carp that were given a piece of uh, non-natural DNA encoding a fluorescent protein from jellyfish and that made the, the fish glow. Now that's as far as we got in phase one, but I'm gonna share a, an update just from a few weeks ago. This is that same fish. So these, these little fry that were generated in phase one of the project, 
Uh, anytime you generate a transgenic animal by this method of microinjection, normally uh, there's many cells in the embryo by the time you're doing the injection. And not all of the cells are going to get the, the trans gene, the recombinant DNA. And so, you know, you kind of have to hold your breath for a year and a half. And we have this, you know, a number of fish that look like this that are called mosaics. You can see it's got splotchy expression of that fluorescent protein. So not every cell in its body uh, has the fluorescent gene. And we really hope and cross our fingers at the germline. Uh, so the, the cells that are going to pass on to the next generation have the, the trans gene. We had to wait a year and a half for these fish to reach sexual maturity, but then we, we crossed them out to wild type, and sure enough, we saw several of the fry, about 50% of the fry produced, uh, were fully transgenic. That uh, gives us confidence because it means that our protocols for engineering carp are editing the germline and allowing us to create stable transgenic fish that will pass on the genetic constructs to the next generation. <clears throat> really quick overview of the survey, surveying efforts that we did in phase one. Uh, we, we surveyed over 1,400 uh, mostly Minnesota residents through an email survey through the MICER listserv and also uh, at the state fair in 2018 at the Driven to Discover building. And what we found is that the, uh, in general, the public comfort with physical methods is greater than chemical is greater than biological methods. Public comfort with biological methods is greater than chemical methods. And of the uh, biological methods, there is more comfort with genetic biocontrol than alternative biological methods like predator introduction or pathogen introduction. Uh, now, genetic biocontrol was was a bit of a unicorn technique in the survey in that it was seen to uh, be more effective or have the potential to be more effective than any of the other biocontrol methods or chemical control methods, and also seen to have the lowest likelihood of harming native fish populations. Um, so there, there appears to be public support right now for developing genetic biocontrol. This is something that we're going to continually uh, take the temperature of important stakeholders and the general public. Uh, so that we're not developing a technology that in the end no one will want to use. Uh, within different types of genetic biocontrol, there is more support for methods like sterile release and less support for gene drives, but we're still moving forward with all those techniques in the lab just so that we can generate the lab proofs of concept and just make sure that they are, are going to be feasible moving forward. And so in phase two, uh, the, the goal is to demonstrate uh, proofs of concept in the MACER containment lab for several different genetic biocontrol strategies. Uh, I'm going to go through these bullet points in the next few slides, so I won't read them to you here. Uh, we're kind of throwing the, the kitchen sink at uh, creating genetic biocontrol agents in this phase. And what we realized is that the, the capability we developed in phase one mm -hmm. of being able to genetically modify CARP, that's kind of a rare capability. There's only a, you, know, you can count on one hand the number of labs around the world that have the ability to modify CARP. Um, there may be one other in the United States. Uh, there's a few in China. Uh, but because that's such a, a unique capability, we decided not to stay in our swim lane in terms of only developing the genetic biocontrol approach that we invented in the lab. But we're going to try out other genetic biocontrol approaches invented by others as well. So we already have fish that have been engineered to contain uh, transgenes for female lethal for that sex ratio biasing approach. Uh, we're currently working on uh, genetic constructs to encode uh, gene drive approaches that are a more powerful type of genetic biocontrol, uh, but also potentially more risky. And we're also moving forward with our engineered genetic incompatibility for sterile male release. Uh, there's a a really innovative uh, aim in our current project uh, that does sound a little bit science fiction -y. I'm still mind blown that this works, but it's been demonstrated in other fish species like salmonids. Uh, and, and actually it has been demonstrated in carp, but not exactly in the way that we're trying it. Uh, and that's called surrogate, surrogacy, uh, surrogate host development. So the idea is that you can take a carp larva and remove from that carp larva 
the cells that are going to become the germ cells or the, the eggs and sperm uh, in the adult fish. If you isolate those germ cells and then take a different species of fish, in this case, fathead minnows, sterilize the fathead minnow so it doesn't have any of its own germ cells, you can actually inject into that sterile fathead minnow the germ cells from the carp with some frequency, those germ cells will engraft in that surrogate host. And uh, when that host organism matures in a much shorter time frame than carp, mind you, uh, these fathead minnows will produce eggs and sperm that are fully carp. So, you know, imagine this that we have little fathead minnows just three inches long, that when we mate them together, they produce a wild type carp offspring. Um, that has a lot of advantages to us. One, it's going to accelerate the engineering because it's going to reduce the time to get to sexual maturity from a year and a half to two years to three to six months. Two, it can uh, dramatically change what the husbandry looks like because we could do all of the engineering of carp biocontrol agents in small fish tanks instead of the, the large you know, 12 foot diameter tanks that you'll see on the tour tomorrow. And so, so we're moving forward in this. We've had success so far in labeling these primordial germ cells. Uh, we have success in rearing fathead minnows and getting them to spawn in the lab. And so I'm excited in the next uh, year and a half to uh, develop this technology, this capability that will really accelerate our carp engineering efforts. And lastly, for outreach in this phase, uh, we're performing uh, a series of stakeholder engagement workshops uh, to translate a, a system of classification called the Technology Readiness Level Scale that was developed by NASA in the 1980s uh, for the genetic biocontrol community, specifically for the aquatic invasive species community. Uh, really what we learned is that there's a lot of stakeholders that need to be engaged with the technology development from regulators, uh, DNR, EPA, USDA, technology developers, technology funders, uh, the public. And we want to develop a shared language to communicate how, how mature is a technology. Uh, so for example, in this technology readiness level scale, when you get to a proof of concept in the lab, that's really just technology readiness level three. And there's a lot of maturation that needs to be done before small scale field trials or large scale field trials or eventually uh, full-scale deployment uh, would be appropriate. So we had our first workshop in June. Uh, it was a two-day workshop, it went great. We're planning on writing up a manuscript from that workshop and, and we'll hold three more workshops in the next year and a half. Uh, I'll say this is uh, not just a local effort, but we've built a consortium of uh, domestic and international stakeholders who are interested in developing genetically modified carp for carp biocontrol. We have collaborators in Australia and different states in the US. And, and we're uh, meeting as part of these workshops to uh, make sure that we're not reinventing the same wheels, but that we're working synergistically together uh, so that if, if one of us gets to the finish line in developing a biocontrol agent, uh, everyone will benefit from that. And so with that, I will acknowledge the funding. So MACERC has been incredibly supportive. Uh, the resources that they provide, both financial and infrastructure in terms of the MACERC containment lab are, uh, you know, without those resources, this project wouldn't be possible. I've had a lot of bright and courageous uh, graduate students and postdocs working on this project. Also like to acknowledge our collaborators, uh, Pshemek Bayer, who I believe you heard from, if you're in this room in the morning session, uh, also, Perry Hackett, Michael O'Connor, Max Scott with some of the, the insect work. Uh, so with that, I will uh, entertain any questions you, you have. Sorry for not getting that video to work, but let's see. I'm going to check the chat now to see if, uh, yes, the Corey did put a link to the, the YouTube animation, which does make some pretty out there references to movies I hadn't heard of. Uh, but it's a it's a overall a good description of how our technology works. 
Um, so thanks, Mike. Um, we are open for Q&A, so please go ahead and drop your questions in the Q&A box by clicking on it at the bottom of the screen. Um, Mike, I'm not sure what is up with our sound. We're looking into that, but I could share the video with captions on if you think that would helpful be helpful. Otherwise, we can just let people view it on their own. Yeah, we'll let people view it on their own. Okay. Um, so our first question is, if engineered carp were released in the U.S. to control carp, what are the risks that engineered fish would end up in native environments? Ah, so uh, the so common carp, or is commonly called Eurasian carp now, you know, comes yeah. from uh, Eastern Europe, Western Asia, and so the question is, if we release a biocontrol agent for common carp. Uh, will it get back to suppress populations in its native habitat? And that's where that, um, if you entertain me going back a bunch of slides, um, the slide I had describing kind of the, uh, this dimension of uh, strengths and weaknesses of different biocontrol approaches, that's where this is really important. So the most aggressive biocontrol, which would be a threshold independent gene drive, um, that would be harder to contain. And, and that's one of the risks in using one of those aggressive uh, biocontrol approaches. But if all you're doing is releasing sterile, uh, incompatible male carp into a body of water, um, that's not going to be powerful enough to make it, you know, that's going to provide localized suppression. So it's unlikely that those fish would even leave that body of water. Uh, but if they do, they're not going to spread any transgene. So when that biocontrol agent dies, the biocontrol that it provides dies with it. And so the, there are techniques for genetic biocontrol that are both spatially and temporally constrained now, the, the downside to those ones is that they're, they're not as powerful biocontrol. And so to achieve population eradication in a given area like Minnesota, it would require releases probably every year for several years. Um, but again, the advantage is you can always take your foot off the gas and that will prevent it from ever getting back to its native range. Um, another one that came question that came in is um, let me read it here, summarizing briefly. But um, this technology that's being developed for carp, it has been used in other species as well. If it's developed and effective in carp, how easily would that transfer to other invasive species? Would that would it kind yeah. of would you have to start from the beginning with a new species, or would it kind of give you a leg up on a new species? Nope. It definitely gives you a leg up. Um, so our approach is, uh, so the, the things that need to change a little bit are that that tool that we use to drive gene expression. Turns out the ones that work in insect work well in fish as well. So that we didn't need to reinvent the wheel. In plants, so the application of this technology in plants is that if you have a GMO crop and you don't want the transgenes getting out, you can make it a genetically incompatible uh, organism. And in plants, we had to do more reinventing of the wheel because those are less, those are more distantly related to insects and fish. And so the way we see this working is that like in insects, we, we started out with a model lab insect um, and we, we learned a lot in Drosophila melanogaster. And we're jumping from that model lab insect to several uh, applied pest insects, one of which is a kissing cousin of Drosophila melanogaster called Drosophila suzuki or spotted wing Drosophila which is a pest of berry farms. Um, in carp, for fish, we, we did some initial experiments in zebrafish, which is a fast growing lab model organism. And we learned a lot in zebrafish to allow us to make the jump into carp. And when we succeed in carp, it's gonna be much easier to transition from carp to, for example, other invasive carp or other uh, aquatic invasive species. Now, the, the requirements that we have to develop genetic biocontrol is one, we need to be able to rear the organism through its entire life cycle in the lab. Uh, that's more difficult for things like zebra mussels than it is for carp right now. And so, you know, right now we're kind of waiting on the sidelines with zebra mussels for uh, that lab rearing to 
be more commonplace and easier. Um, but for, for other fish that can already be grown in aquaculture, uh, the transgenesis methods are pretty robust and they should work in diverse organisms. Sequencing a genome, you need to know what the genome sequence is, but that only takes a couple of weeks to do now. Uh, so even if there's not a good genome sequence for something like you know, a new emerging aquatic invasive species, it's pretty straightforward to, to read the DNA out uh, ourselves. And yeah, so it does get easier with each new uh, organism we target, especially if we're just targeting additional fish species. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Um, and then we have just one more question that's come through. So if you do have questions, please pop those into the Q&A. Otherwise we can always wrap up a little bit early here. But um, the next question I have is, you mentioned this a little bit in your presentation, but if you could just kind of recap or clarify this, project is in its second phase here at Maserk. Um, can you kind of venture a guess on the horizon of this technology, how much longer um, it will be in development before it is kind of, we start having a discussions about use? Well, uh, we have discussions about use starting like negative one year yeah. ago, right? Because yeah. we, yeah. we, we know that we need to start those discussions early and often. So we've been engaged with the Environmental Protection Agency, the USDA, the Minnesota DNR. Just two weeks ago, I went down to the Minnesota DNR uh, just for kind of a an informal chat session where I describe not only our efforts, but efforts that I know about. You know, when I go to conferences around the country, around the world, I talk with people developing genetic biocontrol for a whole slew of organisms. And, and so uh, those conversations are already happening uh, because we want to, we don't want anyone to be surprised when all of a sudden we say, oh, we have the biocontrol agent, we're, we're registering for a field trial. Uh, we want to give, make sure there's plenty of runway. But in terms of how long could it take uh, I mentioned that we're developing several different types of genetic biocontrol and that they have different strengths and weaknesses. And one of those uh, differences between them is how long it takes to engineer. So in the lab right now, we've injected fish with constructs that ought to provide sex ratio biasing. And uh, you know, the first generation, the first fish that we inject are gonna be mosaic. So not every uh, cell is gonna be modified we'll have to outcross those to wild type in another year and a half. But those, those next generation could in theory be the biocontrol agents. So we're looking at as, as close to two years from now, having a laboratory proof of concept. Now, just because we have the fish in the lab doesn't mean it'd be ready for a field trial. We would of course do a, a lot of characterization in the lab first, uh, but you know we're looking at less than five years for some of these biocontrol uh, methods. The engineered genetic incompatible uh, approach, it's, it's got a lot of advantages, but its disadvantage is that it takes much longer to engineer. Um, it's, it's kind of like the, the analogy I give. If some of you know the riddle about, uh, you know, you're on one side of a river and you have a fox, a chicken, and a bag of seed, and you can only take two things with you in a canoe across at the same time, but the fox eats the chicken, the chicken eats the seed. How do you get across a river? We have to solve a problem very similar to that, to load the toxin and the antidote into the uh, engineered strain in a way that when we're, when we're doing the breeding, we never get a wild type gene in the same organism as a toxin, because that'll just kill that that organism. So it's a bit of a, a Rube Goldberg approach to generate the EGI line. It's possible we've demonstrated it in several organisms already, but that's more of like a five to 10 year project. That's why we're, we're really hoping that the surrogacy and fathead minnow works out because that can reduce the timelines for that multi-generational engineering approach several fold. Great. But in general, if you want a, a nutshell answer, I would say uh, five-year horizon for uh, some of the more straightforward to engineer approaches. Okay, thank you. Um, and then this will probably be our last question so we can wrap up at 11. Um, but the question is, what risk is there for genetic transfer to non-target organisms? You touched on this a little bit, but could you recap that question here? Yeah, I, I mean, so the, the DNA that we introduced to these organisms 
works and behaves the same way that the DNA they already have works and behaves. So uh, the chances of our DNA getting into non-target organisms is the same chance as you getting uh, corn DNA when you eat corn on the cob uh, or, or you know, carp spreading their DNA into walleye. It, it doesn't happen, right? The way that we get our genome is through sexual reproduction and different species that are in the, the kind of definition of species that you learn about in uh, high school biology classes, you know, a species group defines where the genes can flow within a population. So if, if two organisms can mate to make fertile offspring, then they're in the same species. And so this can spread to different populations of carp, but it won't spread outside that species. And it won't even spread from common carp to uh, Asian carp or kopi. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to, invasive carp. I know there's, uh, I think the politically correct term is now invasive carp. The Illinois uh, appetizing correct term is kopi now, uh, but it, it, common carp DNA doesn't even spread to those carp. So uh, it's very species specific. It won't spread outside the target organism. Great, thank you, Mike. 